It can send chills down your spine. And it exists in every culture and history. Music is considered the world's most natural high. And new research at McGill University says it's all connected to the brain. Valerie Salampour and her team headed a study at the Montreal Neurological Institute to discover if, in fact, music is as pleasurable as sex and good food, or in scientific terms, if it's part of the dopamine reward system. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system that helps regulate many things in the body, including pleasure. Usually, behavior is things that last for this long a period of time, or things that are absolutely necessary for survival, things like eating and sex. And um, how music fits into this is sort of a question that we're trying to explore. So the way the system works, when you behave in certain ways that feel good, like eating, your brain wants you to continue, so it releases dopamine, telling you to keep behaving that way. How like a mulling. This idea that music might be involved with uh, the dopamine reward system has actually been around um, for a while. And uh, some people have tried to test it, including our lab, with, with uh, methods that look at um, blood oxygenation changes or blood flow changes. The problem is that um, these uh, methods don't necessarily tell us if dopamine is involved. And then we're going to ask you to close your eyes so we can... Salampour then introduced positron emission tomography, which enabled her to locate the dopamine released in the brain. The way that it works is we have people come in over two days. So one day they bring in music that they really, really, really like, just this music that gives them those really intense feelings. Participants listen to their music under the PET scanners for 15 minutes, giving their brains a chance to release dopamine. After about 15 minutes or so, we um, injected the raclopride into their veins, and the raclopride would go around and uh, circulate in the blood. The raclopride used is a radioactive molecule that binds with dopamine receptors, which can then be viewed by the PET scanners. So if there's no dopamine released, the receptors will bind to the raclopride which will show up on the scanners. If the raclopride doesn't bond, that means dopamine is present. But this part of the test only determined that dopamine was released. It didn't reveal at which points during the music and where in the brain. For the next step, Salampour used functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, to pinpoint the patterns in the brain. What Salampour discovered was that dopamine was being released at two points in the music during the peak emotional moment and 15 seconds before in the anticipation of that moment. Right during that peak pleasure moment, they experienced the dopamine release in the ventral striatum. Now this is the same area that um, shows activity when people, shows dopamine release when people do cocaine, for example. So this is <laughs> really astonishing, the fact that music is actually working in these same areas. The ventral striatum is the lower part of the brain that's connected with emotions and feelings. It's a part of the brain that humans share with animals. But during the moment of anticipation, dopamine was released in a very unique area, the dorsal striatum. This is where higher order thoughts occur, a part of the brain that shows how humans are very different from animals. Basically, it's involved in taking information from your environment, integrating it with previous information, based on that creating expectations and predictions and these predictions lead to sort of cravings and desires and um, the idea is that maybe when we're listening to music um, we're sort of anticipating that next note and the music is sort of going somewhere and it's sort of telling us a story and that creates a sense of anticipation and wanting and desire to hear it. So then can you say that music is addictive? I would argue that our, our society is mildly addicted to music. If you go out into the public, you'll see lots of people listening to music constantly, whether they're exercising or alone, and uh, people are willing to spend so much money on any sort of music-related experience, whether they be going to live concerts or um, the symphony or just buying a better set of speakers. <laughs> In doing the research, Selimpour also discovered something about musical preference. We asked about 217 people to give us music that gives them um, chills or goosebumps or music that they find intensely emotional and pleasurable. And the song that kept coming up over and over again was Barber, Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings. And not many people actually know this piece, um, but uh, as soon as they hear it, they say, oh yeah, I definitely know this piece. That was in the classical genre, and the second most popular piece of music that we got was 
in um, the techno genre, and it was uh, DJ Tiesto's Barber the Baggio for Strings. <laughs> so it was his rendition of it, which was really amazing because obviously Barber's doing something right. Salampour's work has garnered large media attention around the world, but her research doesn't stop there. The next project that um, we've been working on is um, having people listen to new music that they've never heard before because we want to see what exactly is happening in the brain the very first time you start to like a piece of music and why is that different for different people. Until then, pleasure seekers should revel in the music they know. All of these other things that release dopamine have side effects, like eating releases dopamine, but you can't just sit there and eat forever. <laughs> Sex releases dopamine, but it's not as easy to get. <laughs> and um, with music, there are no side effects, so you can listen to it as much as you want, as often as you want, and why not? For The Lab, I'm Adam Avrashi.